Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. At 29,035 feet, it takes 10 weeks to climb. Few have ever made it to the summit, and 180 have lost their lives trying. Eric Weyenmayer will be attempting what few climbers dare. But if he is successful, he will be the first blind person to climb Mount Everest. All right. So should we practice? The steps are going to vary on the different ladders throughout the ice falls. And the ropes will be anchored exactly like this. It's a little bit springy. It's a little weird. And sometimes the ladders are a little bit off kilter. Whoa! <laughs> I love climbing. Here, do that, and then you can save me. I love the experience of it. I love the outdoors. I'm imagining myself like 1,000 feet off the ground. Last step. Yep, there you go. You're at the pole. When you look at a mountain, you almost have to practice this strange form of schizophrenia, where you know that there are great obstacles in front of you, and they're almost insurmountable, but yet at the same time, you, you feel that you can get past those and that you can get to the top. Climbing mountains, tall mountains around the world as a blind person has taught me one fundamental thing and that is that whenever you go through a process Stop. that's never been done before, it's natural to have fear, it's natural to have some doubt, but you have to understand them for what they are. You know, these monsters that kind of lurk at the base of the mountain calling you down. You have to see them for what they are and just try to find a way to to block them out and to stay positive and to move forward. Sure, being able to see is definitely helpful, don't get me wrong, but there are a whole bunch of other things in the equation. What is terrifying for a blind person is patternlessness. And that's why I think a lot of blind people probably are intimidated by the outdoors. Everything in life has a pattern. You just have to figure it out. And even a rock face has a pattern. It's taken me years and years to figure out the patterns of nature. It has been a long learning process, one that Eric began when he started to lose his sight. For Eric, mountain climbing, like blindness, is about overcoming barriers one step at a time. I realized that I was going blind from an early age, but that didn't really affect me. It sort of was like this little sensation of doom in the pit of my stomach. I just tried to be a kid, though, you know? I mean, I like to do things. I like to jump out of trees and land in big piles of leaves. When Eric was little, we had noticed that his eyes were shaking, and my wife took him to the doctors. And it was a, a day which is indelible in my memory because uh, the doctor, after a lot of investigation and tests and everything, came out. And his words are memorable. You know, he said, I'm sorry to inform you that your son will be blind by the age of 13. Eric was born with retinoschisis, a rare disease that causes the layers of the retina at the back of the eye to separate. Over time, as the retina splits into two layers, eyesight deteriorates in pieces. It was explained to us that, uh, you know, this was a one in a few million people disease. I mean, there were really just a few people in the country, uh, maybe a hundred, that had something like this. And Eric was the youngest to have ever been diagnosed. When anyone tried to force me to take a look at what was happening to me, I would block them out. When people talk about going blind, you know, you're gonna, you're afraid of seeing blackness. I wasn't afraid to see darkness. Uh, I guess it was more of a fear of being obsolete, that I would lose out on so many things in life, you know, that I'd be a, a bystander, you know, just sitting there on the sidelines, watching things go by or listening to things go by. I remember that I thought all I want, all I pray for is that he wind up with a meaningful life. To that end, Eric's parents did everything in their power to make certain his childhood was as normal as possible. A lot of people had recommended that his mom and I send him to a school for the blind. Actually, that didn't sound right to me because at that point he still had some vision. He had enough vision to walk around and it was totally unacceptable to his mom. But school after school rejected Eric because of his growing vision problems. Eric's mom persevered, finally winning him admission to a private school on the condition that she provide him with extra help. 
my mom was just like this fierce sort of lioness, you know, mother lioness, just protecting me and making sure that, you know, I didn't miss out on any opportunities, that I was doing things that other kids were doing. You know, like with field trips, you know, she would come along so I could take part in field trips and uh, she would describe things to me. Here's the beta. You're gonna go up to your left. You're gonna scramble, just kind of four point yeah. scrambling. And then you're gonna get up about uh, 10 feet and you're gonna start cutting right. I'll give you the beta for it. You'll go straight up, kind of some more scrambling. But a little for the steeper. past 15 years, Eric has been climbing with Jeff Evans, a career mountaineer and adventurer. To Together they have climbed the highest summits on three continents. I didn't really think of blind people much before I met Eric. So I had some preconceived notions, I suppose, just like everybody else, that you know he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be that good at it. And uh, I realized, you know, right off the bat that first weekend that you know he was he was capable, emotionally and physically, and he's driven. He's super strong and um, was really wanting to take it to the next level. That's a great problem, right there, isn't it? That little roof. What I love about Jeff is that right from the start. He wasn't afraid to link himself to me and, you know, be a team. I respected that a lot. Right now I can see the top of the naked edge and it's, got, it's catching the last few rays of sun. And you know that belt, that perfect Eldo rock, you know, it's just red and green yeah. and brown and black. It's got all these great colors to it. It's just catching the sun. Huh. It's beautiful. Being with him outdoors in the mountains has in a way enriched my experiences because my senses are very much in tune with everything around me. You know, I have to, to look around and, and listen even more. And so as a result, I think that's kind of a gift he's given me over the years. Yeah, Braille menus. Eric and Jeff will travel to Everest with a team of 19 climbers. I love sticking my fingers in those. Actually, I, I, I have to say, no, I gotta say, it's really kind of gross eating nachos with Eric. Gotta watch his fingers. Oh, Get serious. it right in the sauce. That's good to know. Their main goal is to help guide Eric to the summit. During those weeks, each climber will need to depend on the other. Down the hatch. We've almost incidentally kind of developed this, this uh, kind of fraternal bond, you know, where um, just like brothers do, we pick on each other, we laugh with each other, we've cried with each other. <laughs> Two years of intense preparation and physical training finally brings them to this moment. Everest Base Camp is at 17,400 feet above sea level. This is where their quest for Everest begins. Eric's father is there to see him off. That was probably a very, very special moment with a lot of emotion to it because it crossed my mind and I'd push it out of my mind that it could have been the last time I ever saw him. Make sure we get a summit call. Okay. Thanks, okay. Dan. Dan, you're making me get all emotional, man. <laughs> Be safe. Okay. <clears throat> the ascent up Everest takes an estimated nine weeks. During that time, Eric and his team face extreme tests of endurance. Coming up on Superhumans, the ascent up Everest presents some incredible challenges for a blind mountain climber and his team. The difference between life and death is negotiated one step at a time. Eric Weyenmayer is attempting to do what no one has done before, to be the first blind person ever to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Eric and his team's first major challenge is the Kumbu Ice Falls. They need to climb 2,000 vertical feet through a treacherous field of deep crevasses. It's ice boulders the size of baseball to skyscrapers all piled on top of each other in this really chaotic way. And you have to jump from boulder to boulder and they're shifting and and, and rolling under your feet. When you're jumping across those boulders, there's thousands of foot drops on both sides, and there's hundreds of crevasses. Some are so wide, I can't feel the other side with my pole. You want to be an inch off. Eric gets off to an ominously bad start. Most teams do the Kumbu Ice Falls in four hours. It took Eric a grueling 13 hours. I came into Camp One at 20,000 feet, 
Uh, I felt like I was gonna pass out. Mike O'Donnell said I was green. I looked like I'd gone 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. Seeing Eric crawl into his tent so exhausted was a new experience for me because he's so fit, he's so strong, and his spirit seemed down. Um, he seemed really exhausted. There was a moment where I think all of us were like, oh boy, you know, I'm not sure if we bit off too much to chew here. I heard a lot of people say, you're crazy, and not only is he gonna get dead, but he's gonna get you dead as well. And I think emotionally it was really tough on him as well because he felt like he let himself down and let us down. Before the climb, skeptics in the climbing community warned of just such a scenario. There was an article in Men's Journal saying that my friends would have to be watching my every step. I'd risk my life. I'd risk the life of my team. But Eric Weyenmayer had faced adversity before. At the age of 13, as predicted by his doctor, Eric lost his sight completely. Eric will draw on this experience as he fights his way up Everest. It wasn't until I actually went blind and found myself totally blind where I, I couldn't even take a step that I realized that this happened to me. When it actually happened, it was just unbelievable. That had to be scary. It had to be emotionally upsetting. During all that time and during the early parts of his entry into total blindness, he was quite a stoic character, I felt. And he didn't show a lot of emotion or anger to me. I started kind of reluctantly accepting blindness and kind of half-heartedly using a cane and learning to read Braille. I started finding that these tools that I thought would make me different from everyone else would kind of alienate me, actually brought me closer to people and actually brought me back to the world. When Eric was 16, he enrolled in an outdoor program for the blind. It was here that he first went mountain climbing and immediately fell in love with the sport. It was unbelievable. I mean, it was this, this tactile sensation of, of feeling all the textures and, and patterns of hot and cold uh, as the sun touched the rock and, and, and trying to problem solve your way up a rock face using your hands and your feet and your brain. Eric had found a passion that would guide the rest of his life, and with his mother's unwavering support and encouragement, he was acquiring the skills he'd need to live an active, independent life. But just two years after he lost his sight, Eric received an unthinkable blow while attending summer camp. My dad and my, my brother showed up at camp early. They told me that uh, my mom had died in a car accident. So, uh, I, 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 so I, my mom died 20 years ago. I don't. It's hard to talk about. So. Death is sort of one of those things that it's just hard to hard to find a reason for. And in a way, uh, going blind was like nothing compared to that. It was like just just so easy. My mom's death showed me how important life was and how important it is to kind of um, live up to the potential that you know is inside you. So, you know, to not take things for granted, for sure. Coming up on Superhumans, the first leg of the Everest climb took Eric 13 hours, more than three times longer than other climbers. He will need to push harder and find better systems for climbing if he and his team are to survive Everest. Just a few days after Eric Weyenmayer and his team set out to summit Mount Everest, they found themselves exhausted and demoralized. The first leg of the climb took Eric more than three times longer than other climbers. Critics argued that a blind person should not have attempted to do what few sighted people could achieve. Despite these setbacks, Eric still had the full support and trust of his teammates. 
There's been plenty, plenty of occasions where I've had to be on a rope that he's secured in the rock. You know, no one's seen how it's attached. I trusted his skills, and that's a pretty powerful thing. I wasn't nervous about getting dead so much, you know. I thought, you know, hey, we've got a great team of people. If somebody gets in trouble, we'll, we'll, we've got each other's back. We're all working towards one common goal, which is to get Eric to the top. There are all sorts of little things that got me quicker. There were little sections that you could move quickly through, you know, because the consequences weren't that great. There weren't giant drop-offs on both sides. It's an easy cruise. Nice and consistent snow. My friends like Mike O'Donnell would say, okay, cruiser. This is a section that you can cruise. You don't have to worry about consequences. There you go. The ice fall seems so chaotic, but I learned pretty quickly that the ladders were the spot that I could actually rest because the steps were consistent. I knew how wide the ladders were. I knew that each step was the same. Despite the rough start, Eric and his team finally overcame their worst nemesis, self-doubt. When you're climbing a mountain like Everest, you kind of have to force yourself to believe in what you're doing and that what you're doing is possible. Because as soon as you start thinking that we don't have a chance, uh, well, you don't. After seven weeks on the mountain, the team reached 23,500 feet. At this altitude, it becomes harder to breathe, to move, and to think clearly. The team finally resorted to oxygen masks. People said that, you know, when you're in the death zone in this extreme altitude zone, you can't think. It's very hard to think. And some people lose it. You know, they just sit down in the snow. They can't process information. They can't make decisions. Um, you lose your fear of death. And I thought, you know, when I'm climbing, I'm depending on my brain because I can't see. You know, I'm depending on my brain. And if I can't think and I can't see, you know, that's an overwhelming combination against me. At 26,000 feet, Eric and his team prepare for their final assault on Everest. As is standard practice, they head out from their camp at 9 p.m. and climb all night to reach the summit by morning. Leaving for the summit at 9 o'clock at night, it's dark, you know. My friends are, you know, complaining because they can't see very well, but I started feeling like the fast guy on the team. It didn't bother me at all. But the climber's worst fear is realized when at 28,000 feet, they are hit by a sudden storm. Lightning was exploding all around us. It felt like it was right on top of us. And uh, we were huddled together. We weren't sure whether to go forward, whether to go back. Snow and ice was building up on our down suits. We're getting cold. We delayed there for about an hour. Mike, I know you guys are in a storm right now. It's snowing. The team decides to push on knowing their opportunity to reach the top of Everest is in jeopardy. They will walk all night, hoping to make it to the summit by morning. It was about four in the morning that I actually felt a little trace of sun on my face. And I knew that the storm had passed and that, you know, we had made a good decision. After seven weeks on Mount Everest, Eric and his team are only 200 feet below the summit, but they discover a potentially deadly problem the guide ropes needed to get them down are buried in the snow. The ropes that are on, on that section of Everest, we need them not so much to go up, but we want to know that they're there so we can come down. Because when the weather comes in, it kind of turns white out and then we all go blind, you know? And then that's how people get whacked all the time. They just walk off the side of the mountain. A couple of people die on Everest every year. And the day before we left for the summit, a Swiss guy coming down from the summit had had clipped into the wrong rope, and he fell to his death. If Eric and his team could not find a way to descend the mountain safely, they would have to forfeit their only chance to summit. I knew that those ropes were important for us to get down, so I started digging. Eric comes up to me after I finished digging up the ropes. I said, I'm not going to be able to go, you know. I'm digging those ropes out. It's just crushed me. I don't have any juice left. At 28,800 feet and suffering from low oxygen levels, Jeff makes the agonizing decision not to summit with his teammates. I was gonna sacrifice my summit, but I was there, you know, I was there not for me to summit, I was there to get Eric up. I was so deflated because, you know, Jeff and I had been to mountaintops all over the world together. We had trained together, we would suffered together, you know, and 
And I knew the most important climb of our lives, you know, Jeff had just sacrificed himself for me. Eric made the final push to the summit without Jeff at his side. He accomplished what only a select few in the world have done. He was standing on top of the world. It's like your brain just can't believe it, that you're there. And I could hear that sense of space, of sound vibrations, I mean, just moving infinitely forever. It was just like I was, more like I was in space than on the Earth. Good job, Eric. And I watched him just, you know, turn around and drop off the side of the south summit, start going towards the summit. And I said, there's no way I'm gonna let that guy go stand on top. I have to hear about it the rest of my life. So I hopped in right behind him and and uh, we fired across the ridge. And, and uh, he didn't know I was with him actually until we got to the very tip top. And I was like, patted him on the back. I said, good job. And he's like, whoa, you're here. For me, the great news was that Jeff, even though he thought he was done, he was standing there. We're on top of the world. We are on top of the world, the apex of the planet. This moment where your ego kicks in and you think, wow, I've done something really cool. And then you realize that you're just sort of standing on the shoulders of good friends. That's the Everest story. Yeah! Yeah! Eric will always have a place in Everest lore and in the history of mountain climbing as the first blind person to summit the highest peak in the world. But beyond notoriety, the experience has brought Eric great inner reward. I think my reason for climbing isn't that different from anyone else's. You know, people have said, well, why do you climb if you can't see the mountain? And it's like, well, that attitude, maybe I should just go kill myself, you know? <laughs> why do anything if you can't see? There's so much to experience out there. Just because I can't see doesn't mean I'm not living. We are on top of the world, the apex of the planet. 